definitely civilization. You know, I remember the first time I saw Peter Davison as the fifth Doctor. Oddly enough, it wasn't in Earthshock when they did the Doctor Who Revisited. I actually, I think I missed that. Or no, I think at the time, I saw um, Time Crash. It was the 10th and 5th Doctor, a uh, little um, crossover story. And that was great. I loved it. Also, anyone that says this... Shut up! There is something very wrong with my TARDIS, and I've got to do something about it very, very quickly. And it would help. It really would help if there wasn't some skinny idiot ranting in my face about every single thing that happens to be in front of him. Great, great character. Love him. I'm going back and going through his era... I have to say, he's like the celery he wears. Looks nice, a bit bland, doesn't really go with everything, but you can make some really great stuff with it. That's the fifth Doctor. Peter Davison's Doctor is very... In a lot of ways, he feels like he was selected by committee. And I don't know the story as to how Peter Davison got the job. It doesn't matter. He's here. He's a great actor. So... Yeah, great. But he doesn't look like... Uh, he's a stark contrast to his predecessor and his later successor, Tom and Colin Baker, you know, where those two dress very bombastically and sort of designed to stand out. Peter's Doctor sort of blends into the background in a very interesting way, which is weird because his pants are still just as ridiculous and that costume is just as ridiculous. As the Master once said, he dresses like someone who's never played cricket before. His era, like the celery, is kind of, for the most part, unremarkable. But, but again, there's some good stuff there. There's some good experimental stuff. When I look at the Fifth Doctor's era, I can't help but see that it's a bit like the Hartnell era, and that it's sort of stripped down, you know, we're just traveling. There's no real rhyme or reason. There's no real um, lore-defining moments here. And this is all fine. A... A steady season is just a season where everything is fine. You know, we've got some great highs, some great lows, some mediums. But nothing that utterly changes everything from what we've known before. And the Baker years did that. You know, with the addition of Romana, the Black and White Guardian, the Deadly Assassin, you know, da Davros, who also comes back here, along with the Black Guardian. It's weird that that happens. But it's also important because not only does that bring them outside of just the Tom Baker years, which means they're more solidified. Davros could have never shown up again and no one would have cared. But him showing up again in Resurrection and we'll see him again in Remembrance and I think also in the Baker era and the Colin Baker years. But this sort of cements him as, yeah, I'm not just the guy that talks to the dude in the scarf. Yeah, I talk to all of them, including the one wearing a vegetable. But at the same time, if I had to view his era as a negative, I would say that's the Whitaker era. So both the Hartnell, Davison, and Whitaker eras have this problem, well not even a problem, but they, ha they share the concept of there are three companions, and that's often two companions too many. Maybe one companion too many. In the Hartnell era, that worked because Ian and Barbara are sort of already established. We, we get who they are. There's not much for them to really sort of do much. You know, we sort of have those old sort of sticksy um, uh, tropes. You know, the, the girls stay behind. You know, the Doctor and Ian will go off and do some stuff. And that worked for the time. It couldn't work now. Really couldn't work now. There's No one would buy any of them spraining their ankles. In the Davison era, well, let's skip it. In the Whitaker era, at the point we are now, every character needs an arc. Every character needs something to do. Every character needs a good amount of screen time. You know, they've talked to worth their ages. Yeah, I need to be in every episode. I need to be in most episodes. You know, that has to happen now. The Davison era sort of had to juggle that. And to the era's credit, I think it does it better than it gets credit for, but they also... Where they were able to make the decision, okay, we can't use everybody this episode. So, um, uh, Nissa, you have a headache and for the story Kinda. And, uh, yeah, just, just stay in the TARDIS. This also happens in the audio time in office, where the fifth Doctor and Tegan arrive on Gallifrey, and they can say, well, Turlo can just stay in the TARDIS. We never hear from Turlo. 
that entire story, we just know he's in the TARDIS. And then at the end, we still don't hear about him. So Turtle's been in the TARDIS the entire story, and it is hilarious to me. <laughs> it really is. It really is. I'd hate to think it turns out that Turlo did come out and that I just missed it, because I'd feel really bad. But that decision sort of highlighted the problem. There can just be too many characters to juggle for a story. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't fall upon the showrunners to make that decision. To use them as best they can, it's just that it's not always feasible, especially since you always have one character that has to be in the, in the episode. Like, we'll, I don't think we'll ever get to a Doctor Light episode where the Doctor is not there at all. The question is, what role does the Doctor play? And we'll get something like that in Blink and Love and Monsters, which I think are two very good arguments as to why it could and couldn't happen. But here, no, it's it's not feasible. It, it just isn't. And to the Companion's credit, whether you like him or hate him, you just sort of get that they're there. <laughs> And the fifth Doctor, to me, he never quite seems to get whether or not he likes them or not. The fifth Doctor feels like he doesn't want to be an action hero, but he sort of is designed to be an action hero. You know, he sword fights, he runs around, he's sort of smooth in his own way. He, tra he blends into a crowd, he knows how to talk to people, but he also doesn't seem to want to hang around them. To me, the fifth Doctor always feels like he's got like a cup of coffee. And when he walks out of whatever room he has, don't know where it is, but he's like, hang on, I can't talk to any of you before I get my coffee. And he has sort of arguments, he lashes out at them from time to time. And I think it's because in a lot of ways, he didn't get to pick them. You know, he had companions that were sort of leftovers from the from the fourth Doctor's era. You know, Adric came from Space, Nissa from Traken. Tegan was on her way to a job when she met the Doctor in Legopolis. And she just kind of wants to go home and he has to keep dealing come along children not in front of our hosts how's your ancient history tegan like i feel awful well not to worry mine's pretty good going with that adra keeps wanting to do more and then debating what debating whether or not he wants to go home he's argumentative and it's just the fifth i was like i don't have i just can't and they argue and sometimes that's great it's great to see characters that don't always get along with each other I think the Whitaker era could use that. Some arguments with companions and the Doctor, arguments amongst themselves, like Yaz and Ryan taking opposite positions on an issue, I think would be great for them. It's somewhat worked out. Also, this era had some really great departures. This leaving the Doctor. I'm not coming with you. What? There's too much to be done here. Tell her she must. Well, you can't stay. It isn't safe. Certainly not until the veneer have sorted out how they're to run Terminus. And with my skills, I can help them. We need you, too. I've enjoyed every moment of my time on the TARDIS, and I'll miss you both. But here I have a chance to put into practice the skills I learnt on Traken. Please, Miss. I'm adamant. Please, let us part in good faith. Adric's death and earth shock. Nissa's departure, as well as later Turlo. My aunt Vanessa said, when I became an air stewardess, if you stop enjoying it, give it up. Tegan. It stopped being fun, Doctor. Bye. Turlo and his, and his departure, they always sort of felt like, with the exception of Adric, natural progressions for the character. You know, Adric's natural progression wasn't death. Well, maybe it was, depending on how you felt about him. But we also got some really great stuff with the Master. The Master who really didn't do anything in the fourth Doctor's era. And I know it's a bit unfair because he didn't like the, he's in the last story, Legopolis. And he plays a role in that one too as well as, you know, in Traken. But here, the Doctor's relationship with the Master feels a bit more central. Where I think in the Baker years, the Master just sort of, I'm the Master! And the fifth Doctor's era is like, hello Doctor. It, it, it sort of goes back to his relationship that he had in his third incarnation with the Master. You know, you're the Moriarty to my Sherlock Holmes. And whichever one you think wants to say that. The Doctor would never say that, but the Master would definitely call the Doctor the Moriarty to his Sherlock. And I like that. I really do like that. 
Um, if I would say the real standout monster for this would be the Cybermen. The Cybermen have always sort of... They, they never had their genesis of the Dalek story in my mind. They've always just sort of been there. Here are the Cybermen. Oh no, the Cybermen. They're, they're sort of here. And I'm like, okay, but, but how? And Earthshock, I think, really sort of puts the Doctor and the Cybermen face to face with each other. When the Fifth Doctor talks to the Cybermen about this issue in Earthshock. Emotions have their uses. The mistakes and curtail the intellect and logic of the mind. They also enhance life. When did you last have the pleasure of smelling a flower, watching a sunset, eating a well-prepared meal? These things are irrelevant. For some people, small, beautiful events is what life is all about. We get the idea that the Doctor is very morally opposed to the idea of the Cybermen. And, of course, then we get the audio spare parts, which delves into not just the Doctor dealing with Adric's death, but also facing the reality of the Cybermen. Great stuff because of that. The Davison years are, again... Celery. Celery can be fun. Celery can just be something you. <clears throat> celery can just be something you have in your meal that's good for you. And then of course we have Perry. who I, I just adore Perry. Not just because she's <laughs> she's Perry, but because she's Perry, and that's great. To me, the Fifth Doctor's era feels like the Land of the Lost opening theme. You know, you just got these people around who are just trying to make their way through this crazy universe. And that's fine. On the downside, though, there never quite feels to be the same dynamic that you would have with, say, the second Doctor and Jamie, the third Doctor and Liz Shaw, the, or the Brigadier, or the fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane. There's no real camaraderie relationship there. And I think that's what holds it back. And I think it's, again, because there's just too many of them. Even when it was just Tegan and Turlo, it was like, okay, so who does the Doctor have the best rapport with to, to match that? I don't think it was ever there. But I never got the feeling that they weren't trying. The idea that at one point Tegan just can't deal with all the death and destruction, I think is something that gets downplayed a bit. But, you know, traveling with a doctor, it can either make or break you. You know, and I think it made Nyssa. It made Romana. It made Sarah Jane. It made Jamie. Totally forgot it. You know, same with Joe. And it broke Tegan. And it broke Adric. Different ways of breaking. And it also made Turlo. By the end of it, Turlo was no longer someone, you know, hiding from what he'd done. Or just, you know, his weird convoluted story, which I still don't get. I'm going to have to read it later. But whatever. That was, to me, that's what to me is always going to be the great stuff. It's one of the experimental stuff like Kinda and Snake Dance. Which, you know, to me is up there with stuff like... Uh, anything from the Hinchcliffe era, which is like, you know, let, let's try to do something fun. You can really only do that if the rest of your season is turns out to be pretty steady. Because if your experiment crashes and burns, history will look back on it fondly. But, you know, at the time, no, it won't be. You need steady eras. You need steady seasons who may not, you know, be flashy, but there's substance to them. That kept the show afloat. Peter Davison had to come on after Tom Baker who is still today regarded as the most popular incarnation. He was essentially the guy that goes into the comedy club and goes in after Robin Williams. It's an impossible task. And unlike most comedians that went after Robin Williams, Peter Davison was able to do it in my mind, despite that very bland costume. This might be my least favorite costume before that one. I loathe this costume. It's just so stupid. But Davison is just like... Anyway, so let's talk about the ups. The, the, my favorite episode of this. Um, Castrovalva is a great post regeneration story. It's got the master. It's got Adric doing stuff. Adric mostly off screen for this. Again, managing three companions. Sometimes just take him off the screen for a bit. Four to Doomsday is sort of fun. I wouldn't. It's all right. It's all right. I, I liked it. Um, Earthshock, obviously. Death of Adric. Snake Dance. You, you can't really watch Kinda and not go to Snake Dance. It, they just sort of complement each other. Arkham Infinity for Omega, one of my favorite characters in Doctor Who, as well as the fact <laughs> that uh, there's a very cool cameo that people didn't get at the time because it didn't, it wasn't a cameo at the time. But let's just say worlds collide here. We had an unofficial multi-Doctor story in Arkham Infinity. And, of course, The Caves of Androzani, which is still like one of the highest rated episodes of Doctor Who to date.
So points to that. Also, that episode is is I think great. It's it's comparable to the invasion from the second Doctor's Day in my mind because very rarely do you have an episode where the Doctor's just trying to get out alive. He doesn't really solve this issue. He doesn't come out on top. He's just able to get out alive. And this regeneration scene, to me, was definitely what was used to inspire um, the doc uh, the Twelfth Doctor's regeneration sequence at the end of the Doctor Falls. Anyway, with that in mind, let's bring this video to close here. If you are new to the Bucket Think Tank, feel free to like, comment, share, subscribe, smash that thumbs up button. I will catch you all later. This is the Bucket Think Tank signing off. Thanks for watching, and as always, may your fandom serve you well. What was it you always told me, Doctor? Brave heart? You'll survive, Doctor. You must survive. Too many of your enemies would delight in your death, Doctor. Brave heart? You're needed. Survive. You mustn't die, Doctor. Too many of your enemies would delight in your death. You know that, Doctor. You mustn't die, Doctor. You know that, Doctor. Adric? You know that. You mustn't die, Doctor. No, my dear Doctor, you must die. Die, You're expecting someone else? I... 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 That's three uh, eyes in one breath. Makes you sound a rather egotistical young lady. What's happened? Change, my dear. And it seems not a moment too soon.